Our speaker tonight is Senator Glenn Hager. He's a Republican member of the Texas Senate, representing the 18th District, which is a district west of Houston. He's actually the youngest member of the Texas Senate. He's a sixth generation Texan who farms on land that has been in his family since the mid 19th century. He has a BA from Texas A&M University. Can't believe it. Um, MA and a JD from St. Mary's University and an LLM from the University of Arkansas. Why went to Arkansas? We'll have to ask him. Okay. <laughs> he was elect elected to House District 28 in 2002 and after two terms won the SD 18 seat that he currently holds, like in 2006. He was elected twice, in the two, uh, two times, and I noticed that. The last two election cycles, 2010 and 2012, this is, I assume, because of the redistricting and you, you uh, pick the, the short straw. But I mean, this guy's used to campaigning. He went to the Senate so he didn't have to come campaign every, every other year. <laughs> Hasn't worked out so well. He missed one cycle. Uh, Glenn currently serves as the chairman of the Senate Committee on Nominations, and he's a member of the committees of Finance, Natural Resources, and Finance, Natural Resources, Agriculture, Rural, rural Affairs, and Homeland Security. Uh, on Senate Finance, Senator Hager not only helps craft the state budget, but serves as the chairman of the subcommittee charged with the review of the state and local revenue matters. Uh, Glenn has been recognized for a strong stand on Second Amendment rights when he was awarded the Doc Brown Legislator of the Year Award in 2009 by the Texas State Rifle Association and for his work in ensuring Texas re uh, retains a world-class justice system with the Civil Justice Le Leadership Award from Texans for law Lawsuit Reform. In recognition of his pro-business voting record, the, the Texas Association of Business named Glenn a champion for free enterprise, its most prestigious award. The Texas Mining and Reclamation Association named him the Legislator of the Year, and the Texas Poli Municipal Police Association awarded him the Legislative Le Excellence Award. In prior sessions, he was recognized as the best legislator, as the Rookie of the Year for the 80th se session by Capital Inside, Inside, and received the Legislative Excellence Award from the Texas Municipal Police Association. The Star for Rural Texas from the Texas Farm Bureau, and the Perfectly Pro-Life Award from the Texas Right to Life. So I think he's got a lot of awards. <laughs> he's only been up there 12 years, so I think, I think that's pretty impressive, frankly. That's why I went through all that. In the March uh, 2014 primary, Glenn, who was endorsed by our group, received 49.9% of the vote for the Republican nominee for the Texas Controller of Public Accounts. I wonder what that was due to our recommendation. Um, that's to fill a seat that uh, was is being vacated in January by retiring Susan Combs. When his runner-up runner declined to participate in the runoff, Glenn became the Republican nominee. He will be facing the Texas, uh, the Democratic nominee, a fellow by the name of Mike Collier in November. Mr. Collier is attempting to label himself as the watchdog. <laughs> Maybe you can tell us that. Senator Hager is a true conservative who strongly defends the value of faith, family, and freedom. In his 12 years in government, he has reduced government inefficiency, saved taxpayer dollars, and provided common sense solutions to problems facing everyday Texans. He lives in Katie with his wife, Dara, and their three children. Please give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. It's great to be with you. Uh, one reason it's really good to be with you is because I've been in Austin for the last two days, and it was nice to be out of Austin. So needless to say, you're talking about the, the controller's race. I don't think the folks in Travis County voted for me as strong as the people here in Montgomery County did. Uh, actually, I don't think most of them voted in the Republican primary, actually. But I will say, I wanted to mention, thank you for the support in the election, as John had mentioned. I've, I've been used to a few close races when I ran for the Texas House of Representatives back in 2002. It was three counties, my home county of Waller County that I grew up in all my life, and then also part of Fort Bend, where we call home now, and Morton County, down Highway 59. And on election night, there were five of us. We stayed up till 2.30 in the morning because we were waiting for one precinct 
out of all three counties determine out of the top three which of the two were going to be in the runoff. And so that night, after 2.30 in the morning, the last precinct came in. I had 29% of the vote. Next guy had 20. It was 29, 28, 27. So it was a pretty close race. So come to this race, and in the primary on election night, I forget some of the first returns that came in. They were in the high 40s, and we felt pretty confident, very good about at least the numbers of moving into a potential runoff. And at the end of the night, the numbers kept creeping up, 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 up. And I want to say thank you very much for y'all's very strong support to be able to garner probably, I think, if memory serves correctly, about 68% of the vote here in Montgomery County is really phenomenal. To match some of the counties that I have represented for several years in the 70s and 80s is truly phenomenal. And I would say it's because of all y'all's hard work. When I was over here at a, at a speech, we were over uh, the, the chamber was having an event, and so not long after that, it was drizzling, it was rainy, it was cool outside, and after I was at the event, I went to one of the polls, and who's out at the polls? Y'all are. And it's drizzling, rainy, I mean, it's just amazing to say that. I mean, I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it, but on the end of the election night, but again, imagine it was about 2.30 in the morning, and we ended up having 49.99% of the vote. <laughs> so I went to bed for a very short nap, got up just a couple hours later, called my campaign team. They were down in the Kadish area, and I told them, let's just get together at, at, at my house. We'll watch the election returns at night. So I got assembled them up very early in the morning, talked on the phone a few minutes, trying to figure out once we realized that there was a county in South Texas that had not returned, had not turned in their election results yet. And so somebody had tweeted out as Glenn Hager pulling an LBJ as to all the magical numbers that he needs, because I needed 76 votes to win outright. Well, the county came in, but no, I'm not an OBJ, and it didn't push me over the top. Um, it changed the number, but I was at 49.99. Travis County opened up late because they had the ice storm that many of us were in. And so the, the last two hours of voting past 7 to 9 o'clock had to be counted in election night. Those numbers came in a day later, and actually, I was still at 49.99%. Somebody had called me, there was 234 million ballots in, in Denton County that had not been counted, they thought they had been counted, they had not been counted, they counted those that went up, I thought I'll put you over the top, changed the number, it kept me at 49.99%. <laughs> so I felt like that guy in that movie Groundhog Day, <laughs> and it just keeps going and going and going. As, as John mentioned, my, my, my uh, number two opponent who came in second, he had decided that it was close enough and he would withdraw from the race. But two weeks after the election, when the military ballots and provisional ballots were actually canvassed, Public Party canvassed all the votes. I ended up having 50% plus 42 votes. So, what I want to you, and I tell people that because every single vote counts. When I came over here to speak the day, I think it was a day or two after the election, to another group here in Montgomery County, and I told them, Hi, my name is Glenn Hager, and either I'm your Republican nominee or I'm in a runoff, and I'm not sure which one, but it is amazing two, two weeks later, and I can promise you, of that 42 votes or 41 vote victory margin, you played a role in that. And the reason I tell people that is not just necessarily about my race, but how every single vote counts. And when you go to whether it's this election that's going on today, whether it's the fall election for this fall, I can tell you about a race that was even a little bit closer than my Senate district. Earlier this year, one of the counties I represent, there were two people, and just remember, two people running for county judge. They had a runoff. No, it wasn't an Aggie that was the election administrator who counted the votes. They tied. There were 18 other votes in that election than there were in the other races. So they had to go to a three-month runoff because one of the 18 people didn't vote. And I tell you that, again, because every single <coughs> vote counts, and it makes a difference. And one of the reasons I say that as I go around, you know, I'm running for Texas Comptroller. And in part, one of the reasons I'm running for this position is I love this state. You know, I don't know why my family got on a boat in 1846, came all the way over and landed in Galveston, Texas, of all places. Back growing up on that family farm, people say, well, why do you mention that you grew up on a family farm? 
because I know what it's like to roll up my sleeves. I know what it's like to work hard. I know what it's like to earn a dollar, to hire people, to fire people, and to make a payroll and a budget. And I think that those values are important. Back then as a kid, during my spring break, Christmas break, summer break, which by the way, we're all at Hockley, Texas, which is where our family farm is at. The reason I say those things is because it taught me that work ethic. And I may not have always been appreciated they came here, but I'll tell you, every single day as I wake up and I think about my three children, my nine-year-old, my six-year-old, and six-year-old, I thank God that I live here. And I don't live somewhere else. I travel this state over and over. And why? Because it's the people, the taxpayers. It's their state. It's your state. And as I was traveling the state here earlier this year, there was a radio interview, and it was later in the afternoon, and somebody asked, is it going to what you're doing? I said, well, I'm traveling from here to here today. I'm going here, up, and there. And they said, well, as you travel the state, what have you learned? And I quickly, I didn't expect that question. I quickly said, Texas is a pretty, pretty good place to call home compared to everywhere else. I had made a comment in a speech last night to a group in Williamson County to a conservative, to a conservative club. And I said, it reminded me back when I said that to a few years ago, I was working on a road project in my civil district, and I talked to the tax doc people, and I was com essentially complaining that this was not happening quick enough. We needed to make this happen. The red tape, the bureaucracy, the inefficiency. And I said, well, Senator, you're right, we're part to blame, but the real problem lies in the Far East. And I was stumped for a second. I thought, you know, I've heard a lot of pathetic <laughs> excuses. Now, we can blame a whole lot of different things on this or that, but what in the word does work road project have to do with the Far East? And before I asked the question, I chuckled and I thought, I think I got the answer. And he said, do you know what I'm talking about? And I said, yeah, would it be Washington, D.C.? Oh. And he said, you got it. And so, you know, what I say is when I thank God I live here, I don't live on the East Coast and the West Coast. You know, if people want to come here to Texas, they're moving here. Many of you may have moved here, may have grown up here all your lives, been like my family, been here a while. If you want to come here and work hard, they want to create businesses, they want to create jobs, I welcome that. But if you want to fundamentally change what Texas is, you can go back home. You know, as uh, my, my opponent, we're talking about being here tonight, I was thinking about it, I was calling my wife on the phone earlier today. And uh, she had read something that one of my three opponents, I have a Democrat, Libertarian, and a Green Party member this fall. I don't know what it is with me and four people in elections, uh, four in the primary. But the fact is, is it's, it's funny to me because one of them has been running TV commercials attacking me, which personally I take that as compliment. Uh, number two has been saying, I want to be above politics. I want to be above politics, which I actually agree. I get tired of people who are politicians that always want to attack other people and don't want to ever tell you something about themselves. You know, if I talk about things that I believe that my faith, that I grew up, the grandson of a Baptist preacher, why is that? Because it's part of my upbringing. And I think it's important to pull the layers back to see who is your, who is, what is your core, what is your character, what do you believe in? Maybe I talk a little bit about what I believe in or what I've, what I've done in the legislative sessions and why I've done that. And I go, well, what does that have to do with the Texas Comptroller's Office? It may not directly impact the constitutional functions of that office. And the constitutional functions are really three primary things. Number one, the treasury. For who? The taxpayer. It's your money. Number two, the revenue estimator. Tell the legislature this is how much that your taxes are coming into state government and this is what's going to come in in the next two years for the next legislative cycle. And then number three, be the tax collector. And I tell people that because why? Not because people used to get stoned years ago for being a tax collector, but if I'm running for a job, I'll be proud of the job that I'm going to do and serve people about customer service and about also having the integrity to tell them about who you are. My, one of my opponents had made the comment that... Uh, Earlier today, he said, oh, well, somebody had asked him about tea parties. And he had said, oh, yeah, those guys should be kicked out. And I thought, what, what does that mean? Kicked out because he said the Pledge of Allegiance? He said prayer? He said kicked out because God bless America. Kicked out because you believe in constitutional liberties? 
kicked out because you think you've actually been taxed enough already? Yeah. What are you going to be kicked out for? So the reason I tell you that comment, which I thought was very amazing to me, is because I don't think he quite understands what Texas is and what Texas needs to continue to be and how we need to improve this state in the right directions, not just for this state, but for this country. You know, as I'm sitting here and I see, this is what freedom looks like. It's about praying for our military men and women who are serving to give us the freedoms and the liberties to be in this country. As we were saying the prayers, I was thinking about what we have to keep in our prayers and our thoughts are not just people here, but people that are being persecuted because of their religious beliefs around the world. Those people... Uh, I tell people in part, growing up, and this is very complicated, I grew up the grandson of a Baptist preacher. My grandmother on the Hager side was a very strong Baptist. I became Lutheran. Passed by the Lutheran church where my wife and I got married just on the other side of Tom Paul earlier today. Why? My wife was Lutheran. And you didn't see it in the bio, but we attend a, more, we attend a Methodist church. <laughs> wow, is that confusing? That's really a mixed marriage and somehow getting around. But, you know, the fact is, is we end up where we're at today. Why? Because it has programs that are very good for our three kids. And I believe that foundation that we lay today will carry them off in life. And, and what, we, what do we uh, want our children to have it still in them? As Texas Comptroller, what do I want to accomplish? I want to accomplish some very basic common sense things. And I think too often people want to cloud everything and make it too confusing. Where you have to have number one is what I said is customer service. Who comes first is the taxpayer. I said a story last night that I had forgot about several years ago in one of our businesses. The legislature had changed the way you dealt with some kind of a tax form that you had to fill out. And I was looking at the form, and I couldn't figure out which form it was to fill out. So I called the 1-800 hotline. Thought, that's what it's for. I'm going to call customer service. I'm going to get an answer. And I got an answer, but the answer was for an airport. I don't own an airport. So I called a second time. I got a second person on the line. The second person gave me an answer. It was for a fuel distribution business. I don't own a fuel distribution business. And I thought, what am I not explaining correctly here? So I called a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time. I explained every single time what my business was. And do you know how many different answers I got? Five. Yes, yeah, six. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 that's actually the next one. How many of them was correct? Zero. That's not customer service. That is not customer service. I want to make sure that we focus primarily that the core constitutional functions of this office are the, are the functions that we focus on. And that ends up to deal with who? The taxpayer, number one, is the tax collector. And I'm not going to hide from an office or a job that I am seeking. I'm going to make sure that when we do our revenue estimates to the legislature that we are true and accurate. Now, I will say this. Texas, of course, is unique again. We meet legislatively, not every single year, like our neighbors of Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, or the state that's more populous or less populous, one in three in the nation, of California and New York. They don't just meet all, every year, they meet all year long. We meet 140 days every two years. And I can tell you, we were better off because of that. gentleman tell me several years ago I was giving a speech in Jackson County and I mentioned how I was uh, proud that we meet every two years and he came up to me and he put his finger right up to me and he said I want you to know you're wrong and I thought okay I said a lot of stuff in my speech I wonder what, what it is I'm sitting there trying to catch through my head real quick and I asked myself sir could you tell me what he said, I'll tell you what I'll tell you what you want to know what he got out of my misery tell me what and uh, I remember I was standing at the door kind of by the exit back there and uh I said, yes, sir, please tell me what put me out of my misery. You kind of point your finger at me, and uh, I'm not kind of drawing a crowd here. And he said, you're wrong. Y'all need to meet in legislative session every single year. And I thought, one of, which one of these other states did you move from? Uh, you sound like me. You sound like you're from Texas. So I'm confused. Why do you want to meet in every, every single year? And I said, sir, could you tell me why? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I'm like, golly, what does this man want? And he said, I'll tell you why you need to go in the second year and repeal everything. <laughs> and I 
and I thought, can I get your card or something? <laughs> so uh, that that one, I've never forgotten that because I thought that that was great. And, and and part of the reason I say that is because the question is, is what is government trying to do in the community today? And it's not about what can government do for you. That real question ends up, what can it do to you? That's the real question. And so what I want to make sure is that you're focusing on the very basic things and you're tending to those services. This is a good state. We do have a lot of issues. We have a lot of challenges ahead of us. I'm not going to talk about Washington, D.C. Uh, that is not something that I ever want to go to. I do think that we need to send the administration bills for things that we're having to pay for. Texas taxpayers are paying for because they are not going to be job. And there is enough of that. But it's great to be with you. I'd rather hear questions, comments, issues that you want to tell me rather than me going on about a whole lot of different things. But I am very excited about the fall election. I do think we have some good candidates this fall election that are very blunt spoken, very focused on trying to accomplish what's right from a conservative perspective here in this state. And I'm glad to be part of that. And I want to say thank you very much again for the support that you gave me in the primary. And I just think it is important as we move forward into the fall. It's not about keeping Texas red. It's about making it redder. That I don't want my Democrats, battleground Texas, turn Texas blue, to actually even begin to have a thought that they can turn this state around. If we can push stronger than ever before, They'll kind of be like those books earlier I said, just don't come back. And I think that would be much better, not just for this state, but for the rest of this country. Questions, comments, complaints? Yes, sir. Just a question. You mentioned on the comptroller's office, I don't know if anybody's ever tried to really go into the transparency site and identify on the classifications of expenditures. You have an agency, but then you, they should have financial codes for each services. And then you get to the overall general budget of it, it's got client services and there's one other expenditure. But everything's, I don't even know if a Harvard Law professor could understand the transparency. No, that, that's a very good question. Uh, actually, one of the things that with the current controller, Susan Combs, that I had worked on when I first got to the Senate in 2007 was I felt like that in the 21st century, taxpayers could be able to readily go to the search and to see how your money's being spent who's getting paid, how much, what are the checks going to. And there are some further issues that we need to make sure that it's very readily accessible. The controller's office does a good job of putting a lot of different things on the internet, but one of the problems is, is the searchability of it. And that's one thing that I've been talking about, how do we improve that to make it where you can readily see how much is your money going to for this person, that person, this check, that check, categorization. So the average person that wants to do a search can easily see it. And then also that you pull all this information right now, unfortunately, there's about 12 to 15 different websites. We don't need a whole bunch of different websites for different things. We need one where people can go to and easily search. Because it needs to be right there on your fingertips. It is amazing that this office over time, the legislature, has decided for better or for worse to add things to the responsibility of the controller's office. And the reason I say the three core constitutional functions because I think that it's time that we focus back on some of the basics and not necessarily on all the other things that are put over there over time because they're a distraction. When I was chair of our Sunset Advisory Commission, we eliminated state agencies, actually eliminated agencies, because they didn't have that function that needed to exist anymore today. Save taxpayers over $150 million just in a few simple decisions. I mean, I'll give you one example. One of the agencies was regulating telephones. But the state can only regulate what type of phone? Not a cell phone, I'll give you a hint. Landlines. You know what percent of phones are here in Texas that are landlines? Less than 25%. So we still have people performing a function that doesn't even exist in the middle of our day. Why are we doing it? And so I think you have to ask those tough questions. That's the only way you're ever going to improve. That's what businesses do. That's what individuals do. To improve fraud, waste, abuse, elimination of services, to focus your resources on what it's supposed to be focused on. So thank you for that.
but I'm guessing. Oh, uh, Texas is a great place, but there certainly is a lot of corruption in government. It's, I, I don't it's actually it like marbled beef within the fabric of the body politic. And the Republican Party needs to vet these people a lot better than what's happening because there's so many people that want to run for office so that they can fatten their own wallet or what have you, or raise their own uh, uh, careers. And they don't have a, they don't really care about the people or, or the job or limited government. They're just using that as a vehicle to get where they want. And I'll, tell, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm I'll, I'll tell you something that was said to me when I first ran for office and I became representative elect. I didn't have a Democratic opponent or Libertarian for anybody in the fall. And somebody who was serving in the legislature at the time and told me, Glenn, you're really going to vote. I said, Really? Well, why? I seem like a pretty tough job to me. The complaints. Fight, you're trying to figure out how do you root out issues and problems that people are embedded and don't want to change in any shape, form, or fashion to be better serviced. And so I just asked the question, I said, well, why would it be so great? He said, because you're going to be working with the cream of the crop. And I thought, that's when the farmer side of me, growing up as a kid, I've seen <laughs> wet years, drought years, I've seen tornadoes come through and destroy huge portions of our crop when we thought we were going to get to harvest it as a kid. And I've seen when we've had nothing, about as much as this forward in here, nothing, bad year. And so my thought was, is, huh, must have been a pretty bad year when there was that cream of the crop. <laughs> and I think a lot of people, maybe they run with good intentions. Uh, earlier today, I was in a meeting and somebody told me, they said, Senator, I said, how about just call me? I'm not too much on I will tell you a quick joke, but uh, it's not a joke, it's a funny story. They really look funny on me is when I got sworn into office, my wife and I were sitting in my chair because my grandparents, you only get two other spots on the house floor, and my, grand, my grandmother had cancer and knew she wasn't going to live much longer. I wanted my grandparents there, but I kind of had to have my wife there. Uh, she was the reason I got elected for the most part. So we were squeezed in my chair, and I stood up, and I like to joke every once in a while. I think it's healthy in life. You're very serious, but you also have a little bit of humor. And so I sat back down after I took the oath, oath of office, and I whispered in her ear right here. I leaned up, and I said, you can call me honor now. But she didn't laugh. She turned around and looked at me, and let me just say, still, how many years later, I still wake up every so often. Oh, my gosh. I still have chills when I think about that look on her face. So uh, I can promise you, when this election gets sworn into office in January, I'm not going to say that bad mistake again. Uh, Maybe slow, but I learned from my lessons. But in part, the funny part is, there are too many people that are caught up in titles and things, and it just, it, it gets a little old. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh First thing that we heard relative to the uh, fall campaign was that uh, Attorney General Abbott has $38, $39 million in cash, and then we were asked to go out and work for him. And it wasn't asked in a way to go out and work for the ticket, it was go out and work for him. And I'm not particularly partial to that when we work so hard to get everybody else on the ticket to have the most conservative ticket they've seen around here ever, probably. And uh, I'm wondering, without getting you in trouble, what you think about the efforts made, being made down by or below the government. Very good question. I'd say first is that after I, I won my election, I looked at pretty broke. <laughs> you know, you spend all your money at the one point of all the money that you've raised, whether it's somebody that's giving you five dollars or, or however you accumulate it, it takes a lot of work. But one of the decisions I made immediately is no matter what, I was going to make sure that my campaign staff stay on the board. Uh, so I've got two of them here, Ben and Matthew in the back. And part of that is that they travel around and go to different clubs, whether it's whatever, whoever and wherever. I didn't just see it as something that was part of Glenn Hager, but also part of the team. So in other words, who they're representing and going out working for, they might be my responsibility to pay, but they're part of the overall group. And so that's part of my responsibility and obligation as part of a ticket and part of the team. 
I was talking to uh, my colleague, Senator Patrick, who is our lieutenant governor candidate probably a couple of nights ago, and we were talking about the fall election. And I was with actually General Abbott's team late yesterday afternoon talking with them about some of the fall election efforts. And our victory chair, Christy Craddock, our railroad commissioner. And I feel as though everybody wants to work as part of the team. So hopefully when somebody asked that, I would hope that that was a miscommunication on their part to work for me, not us. Because I will say that I'm not under the, the misillusion that even though I'm sixth on the ballot, after a U.S. Senate, U.S. Congress person in whichever area, governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, then come to the Six is pretty high on the ballot. But the fact is, is most people are going to be paying attention to the governor's race, and then they're going to pay attention to the lieutenant governor's race. And I'm okay with that. I'm more than happy to lend supporting more and make sure that my team is working to support their effort. But it also is that down the ballot, I derive the benefit of that overall effort. And so I would hope that that is something that's in the state because it is a team effort. And that's the reason I said in the beginning, when John mentioned I had your support, I wanted to make it very clear that I would not have been close to 49.99% or ultimately had 50% plus 14 votes. And it was part of an overall great effort. So I don't know if that... Well, again, at the end of the day, just personally, I'm very happy to elevate uh, Attorney General Abbott by elevating the down ballot. I, I, I will push him up by pushing you guys up. And I, I will say that there is no doubt whatsoever in my mind who will do a better job serving this state. It, it is no difference between close the doors, turn the lights out, and then turn the lights back on. It is very crystal clear to me. I have worked with both of those candidates. <coughs> And I know them both very well. And let me just say, for me personally, it is a very, very clear choice on the distinct difference in direction that this state will go. Other questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. So, how long have you been a state senator? I have been in the state senate since 07. Okay. And then I was in the Texas House of Representatives four years before that. So, what made you decide to jump from? Senator, basically, she said, right the yeah, that's a that's kind of one of those bad jumps, <laughs> tax guy. <laughs> but I'm not gonna hide from it because I think that somebody that has convictions, values, principles, that knows that it's a taxpayer. I, I'll tell you actually, it came a session before last that I after a legislative session. At times, typically take, there's always moments in life where you take a step back and go, okay, is this the direction that, that I would hope to go? This is, is this the direction I'm really led for? And so I was taking one of those moments. It was in uh, 2011, and the answer was very specific, that in, in 2011, so three years ago, my children at the time were six, three, and three, and trying to make a decision after not seeing them as much as maybe I want to for the last five months. Getting back on the road, traveling, as John said, campaigning all the time. But then trying to make a decision, what's best for my family? As in, should I just completely retire and focus on business? Still coming up in life, hopefully. Should I focus a different direction on my family? And I talked to my wife about it quite a bit, prayed over it quite a bit, talked to a couple of very close friends for a little bit. And then it was kind of one of those days where I woke up and literally thought, I think this is the direction that I really should go in. And, and in part, I'm not an accountant by trade. That was one of my opponents in the primary said I should win because I'm the first CPA. That's actually one of my opponents right now. Texas has never had a CPA as its control. Should we? Well, it's a free to decide. But what I do know is that I have run businesses before. I've managed one before. I know what it's like to earn money. I really know what it's like to pay taxes. So I know what the average person feels like. That's why when somebody said Senator earlier today and said, I don't think. Because I look at myself as just an average person. 
and in that role, you are really the chief financial officer of the state of Texas, you have a bigger ability to point the legislature in the direction of what do we need to invest in, what do we need to focus on, as uh, working with Senator Packer last session, one of the things that I worked on was trying to provide our public school system with more opportunities for <coughs> online education. The kids that I represent in Fort Bend ISD, Katie ISD, they have it. My kids over in Nordheim ISD, y'all know where Nordheim is? It's the farthest west portion of my district, over in uh, Gonzales County. I went over there to tour several years ago, and I, on the wall they have pictures of the graduating class. And they don't do it as a group picture, they do it as individual pictures. And that year before, in little school, the year before, they had three graduating seniors. Oh, wow. All leaders. Class president, salutatorian, valedictorian. Uh, and I mean, I, I kind of joke, but you know, that year, they literally were saying, in that year, at one moment, they had zero fourth graders, and then they allow students to come back and forth with the other school districts, and then one kid decided to come back to school there, and then all of a sudden, they had one fourth grader. A little different than here, isn't it? Just a little bit. My oldest, my oldest daughter in kindergarten two years ago, we had 1,700 kids. In the elementary school, there's built for 800. Fast growth. We, we kind of know what y'all are experiencing over here. And I, I wanted to expand online education, because I wanted those children in some of these other school districts to have the same opportunity they have over here. And the reason I said, well, what does that have to do with the controller's office? It has to do with how do you improve through technology? How do you improve through efficiencies? How do you look towards how you can do things smarter? And a lot of your job as a chief financial officer is to point those directions out. How do you get a readily identifiable search engine? At the end of the day, the beginning of the day, it stops with me. It's not all the employees. It starts and stops with you. So that was sorry. That has the Baptist preacher side of me coming back down. Yes, sir. I, I totally agree with you. I think one of the things that you recognize is you need more people that are used to running small businesses or businesses familiar with the responsibilities and the things and the issues that come up, and you don't have to be a CPA to recognize and make good decisions. And you know, I uh, actually it's uh, it's our kind of somewhat ironic in part that I thought about being a CPA, but I wanted to go to law school as well, in part that I saw my, my dad and my grandfather, and I've said this several times, where they sealed deals with a handshake, because they believed their work was their bond. I'm a lawyer by education, why? Because I quickly learned that not everybody adheres to that value. So I figured I better go get an education to deal with people who don't believe in that value, and when I got to a my first year, I went to junior college because I didn't think I was ready for that, even though I was accepted up to sit down. I was better stay home. I was a small town kid. And when I got there, I said I wanted to be an accounting major, too, but I'm going to law school. And they said, great, you can. You can stay another 30, 30 hours another year. And I said, hey, you keep it. <laughs> I thought about being a tax lawyer. You know, what do we all have in life? We're born, we die, and we pay taxes. Uh, and it, it's kind of ironic that in 2011, I kind of come back around but it's something that I think the taxpayer deserves the information, they deserve answers, and they deserve it quickly. Because in my office, I tell my people first and foremost, and they, they know this because they've worked for me a while, is if you call, if we don't know the answer, we're going to do it as quick as we can. I expect people to have an answer that day. If we don't have the full answer, I'll explain that. But people deserve service because that's what you're there for. And the day you want to quit doing that, other comments, questions? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Um, if I recall with a long list of your achievements, uh, there, is it, am I correct in, in hearing that, that you were on a subcommittee for Homeland Security? That's, that's one of the, the committees that I'm on. It ends up being, it's, a, it's an odd, odd connection, it seems. Agriculture, Rural Affairs, and Homeland Security. Where'd that patch come from? That's what the Lieutenant Governor wanted to create, so that's what we ended up having. So DPS is also under the jurisdiction of that committee, as well as a, a, an array of other types of agencies, per se. Okay. So DPS is under that committee, and that's what it's called Homeland Security. There's a lot of things that DPS has tried to focus on, on under 
under Director McGraw is how do you deal with security threats that this state faces? Obviously, we're not the federal government, but with that being said, if you look at a, a weekly report, and I get a weekly report of people that are coming across our border, you would be surprised, one, you wouldn't be surprised how many. The numbers, two, you would be very surprised about where they're coming from that are apprehended from all over the world. It's not just straight south. I can promise you that. Uh, I was looking at this report just the other the other night, and I went, oh, and my wife said, what are, you, what are you looking at now? And I said, can you hardly see some of this? And it's pretty amazing. It's just pretty amazing. And so that's why the focus is on the criminal aspect, the drugs, and people who are coming here that you begin to question, why are you really coming from that far away? Who do you want to accomplish you? So it, it, it's, it's, that agency has tend to take on more of, uh, of a view than just policing up and down the streets as far as speed. So then my question would be, yes, um, and I don't know if that was tongue in cheek, but you said that um, you'd like to send some bills to the feds. Um, and I know that you would pursue the federal government in my time. It really wasn't tongue in cheek. I don't expect them yeah. to pay, but yeah. I do think it's important to ascertain and readily identify what does it cost the Texas taxpayers. Yes. And this is what is costing you as the Texas taxpayers. Now, we would be a federal taxpayer as well, but other states don't have to deal with the issues that we have to deal with. And so, well, therefore, ma'am? We're all paying at some point. We're all paying at some point. But the question is, are we paying as a country or are we paying as a state? And there's a little bit of a difference between the two. It, it has a fairness issue is my point. And so, therefore, I have talked about how I think it's important at times to set a bill. Now, they won't pay the bill. I don't know if we can enforce the paying the bill. I think it's important to remind her that the state of what Texas has to deal with compared to another state is vastly different. Very different. Share the board, the board. You're going to come here and raise money, come see what goes on in the state. Yes, ma'am. I just want to thank you, Senator, for your Lynn. profound, Lynn, for your wonderful, wonderful and courageous support for pro-life legislation because you have been a warrior and and those of us in the pro-life community that are lovers of life really appreciate what you've done. You might want to just mention. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, one of, one of the things I know about my uh, one of my colleagues that's running for governor is that if I walk kind of odd tonight, it's because it's from a year ago, I still have those arrows from her in my side. Uh, people talk about her and her shoes and filibuster. I was that mean guy on the other side who was trying to improve women's health care in Texas and save innocent lives. Who people talk about standing and giving a filibuster for X number of hours, which is okay. They don't mention that I stood up for the same time times two. We <coughs> passed the bill in the first special session, which literally I talked about close the doors and turn out the light. It's pretty much how the first special session was. Just about darkness. But the second one, thanks to so many that were there, kept the same thoughts and prayers. We were literally physically and far away and thinking about us and praying for us every day. It was just a total different atmosphere. And uh, I will I will say that it was amazing to me that it was right after we passed that legislation. It was on Friday, which is just a year ago, just a little more than a year ago. And I was in some, our Sunday school class, and we usually had an icebreaker. And the icebreaker that day was, tell us one thing about your summer. <laughs> and my wife, who was the third to the last one, and one of the gentlemen, when it was his turn, he said, well, I can't wait to hear about how your summer's been. And he knew what I'd been doing. And when it got to my point, uh, my wife made some comment about how we went on vacation. And she said, well, but Glenn can tell you a little bit that. One, my vacation was cut short because for the first time in my life, I had a root canal. <laughs> and I had to fly back with lots of pain and do a, a hearing on Monday, have the second part of the root canal on Wednesday, and then pass the legislation off for a day later. So it, it was a rough week, you could say. But I tell you, I told the class that day that if you don't believe in the power of prayer, you should be Because it was amazing to me that the peace that I felt, the second bit of the first one I was pretty calm, but the second one was all guns coming at me. It was pretty amazing. And uh, the peace was because of how many people were literally there with 
Miss Kamani. It was very, very phenomenal. It's something I will never forget for the rest of my life. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you for everybody here. And again, thank you for your support in the primary and in the fall election, and for all of us as a team. Thank you for your time.